My name is Karen Stevens, and I'm conducting an oral history interview with Janet Emerson on Thursday, August 24th, uh, 2017, and this is for the Women's March Oral History Project in connection with the Georgia State University Library's Special Collections Department and in cooperation with the Atlanta History Center. We're recording this interview at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. So Janet, before we talk about your experiences regarding the Women's March, I'd like to get a little biographic information. Where and when were you born? I was born in January of 1942 in Rome, Georgia. Rome, Georgia. Have you always lived in Rome? Uh, I lived there until I was 18 years old, at which point I escaped to the Atlanta area and went to Agnes Scott College. Oh, I see. That's just around the corner. Graduated 1964. Okay. Um, and while we're on that topic, what was your major? It was biology. Biology. And I went on to get a master's at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Okay. And uh, so was that your profession? <coughs> for, for approximately the first 10 years of my uh, working life, yes. Um, then my son was born and I decided that I wanted to do something that was more of like a nine to five job where I was free in the evenings. And, and so I switched to working for the Association for the Clinical Pastoral Education um, as a mostly bookkeeper and correspondent and selling some books that were published and things like that. And so you continued to be in that field um, until you eventually retired, or have you retired? Right, I, I retired from that in 2006 um, because I was old enough to get Social Security <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, so I could devote my full time to teaching piano lessons in my home, which I started doing when my son was two. So I've been doing that for about 35 years. Okay. Still do it. So are you a pianist? I am, but I don't, I'm not a performer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, <laughs> I like to teach. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> what, what political party do you support? Or do you? Oh, I do. Mm -hmm. I'm a Democrat, but I haven't always been. <laughs> my mother, uh, my mother's family uh, came from Germany to France to the United States around 1726 oh. and they settled in Pennsylvania and um, then some of them spread to Indiana and eventually Kentucky and Tennessee where my mother was born um, but they were Lincoln Republicans and so my mother and then my father became a Republican I think his family was probably Democrat um, they became, they were Lincoln Republicans back in the 50s and 60s when this section of the country was solidly democratic. And then when, uh, with the Civil Rights Act, when you had so many people switching from uh, Democrat to Republican, my parents stayed Republican, but I gradually inched towards the Democratic Party, and that's where I am, and that's where I'm staying. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been uh, involved in any political activities in the past? Um, actually, I've been involved in local um, um, elections. Susanna Scott was running for a tax commissioner in DeKalb County. This was a year or so ago. And I, I was really active with her campaign and, you know, wrote letters and went from door to door in my neighborhood distributing yard signs. And um, I got really involved with that. Um, then when John Ossoff started running for, you know, the position in the House of Representatives, I, um, I, I, I went to every group thing I could go to. I went to... Uh, parties at a restaurant where we'd be writing postcards to send out and then also standing in front of North Lake Mall on cer certain days uh, with signs, you know, waving at the 
know, people passing by and handing out literature if anybody slowed down long enough. <laughs> <clears throat> um, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, and I think uh, one time when I was in high school, I actually went with the young Republicans down to see Nixon speak in Hurt Park. I remember that mm -hmm. in the 70s, mm. wasn't it? I, I, I thought it was, bef I thought I was in high school or college. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was the first time he ran when he was running against. Oh. Um, oh, okay. So that would have been about 1963 or 62, gotcha. 60. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I got gotcha. Well, let me ask you this. Do you have any family members who have participated in any sort of activist movements? No, but I read, I think, along with science and music, I love politics. I love reading books about politics. Okay. I'm in the middle of one right now. What is it? <laughs> it has a bad word in the name in the title. Can uh -oh. I do that? Yes, you can. <laughs> it's called uh, the Chicken Shit Club, <laughs> and, and it's written by Isinger, I think is his name, yeah. and it's about how um, CEOs of banks and big companies and all uh, get away with doing things that are illegal simply because of their position and don't ever serve any prison time, whereas the people who actually go to jail are lower management, and that really annoys me. Me too. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And I read one, the book that um, Bowder wrote on um, the Mag Magnit Magnitsky, Magnitsky. Uh, case, the, you know, the sanctions on Russia. Uh, Magnitsky was his lawyer when he was over there with a, a company that sold stocks and bonds in and, and the U.S. as well as uh, Russians to, you know, the U.S. And it was a terrible scandal, and Magnitsky was his lawyer, and he was put in jail. Uh, Browder got out, um, but they eventually killed him in jail, and that's why we have the sanctions that we have on Russia. I didn't know that. It's because of because of that, and they they claim that um, that it didn't happen. I see. But you have to read the book. Can I can I give it its name too? Yes. Red Alert. Red Alert. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It reads like a novel. Really, it pays to read. It pays to read. As a teacher, you would I think you might agree. <laughs> Um, have you participated in a march before? Um, <clears throat> no, I haven't. I got involved in one march where we were marching over close to the World Congress Center, but this has been since that. Okay. And this was because we thought Johnny Isaacson was on, inside the building at a banquet, and we were marching because he wasn't having hall, I mean, um, meetings, you know. Right. Right. For his constituents. Right. Well, let's let's get to it, Janet. Um, why did you march on January twenty-first? Well, I was in church, Unitarian, and they made the announcement that they were getting a bus together, and you know they had fifty-five seats, and so the first fifty-five that signed up definitely had a seat, and I thought, you know. I really don't like what's going on in this country. This was, you know, after the election in November, December. I really don't like what's going on, and I don't know what to do about it. I can keep voting. I never, I, I, since I was 18, I've never f not voted. And so I'm, I'm thinking, what else can I do? I could go to this march. Maybe it would make a difference. And so I signed up. And you didn't like the direction the country was going because? Well, for one thing, I, I really think there, there became a war on women. You know, it, it became, you know, the whole birth control, abortion, uh, Planned Parenthood, you know, all of this to me was saying women can't have their lives like they wanted. You know, if men got pregnant, I'm sure that everything would be legal. And so I think I was really angry. Okay. 
And did you attend the march in Atlanta or Washington? Which one did you attend? It was the one in Washington, Washington. D.C., yeah. What, what, was there a reason you chose that one? Or it was just that the, the opportunity presented itself in church? Well, my son and his girlfriend marched in the one in Atlanta. Uh, and I suppose it was because the, the opportunity presented itself. Okay. And so, you know, I said, okay, there's a bus. I can get there. It's only going to cost $125. We're going to go up there. We're going to march. We're going to get back on the bus and come back home. You know, I can f afford to do this, so I want to do it. Okay. Was there a, an issue that was more important than the others? Well, the, all of the women's issues, you know, and but also immigration, also the LBGT um, situation. I liked how Obama handled all of this. I thought, you know, I thought we we I wish he had been king and we could have kept him. Mm -hmm. um, the immigration, all racial things, you know, the fact that that people of a different race uh, are any different from people who are white. You know, I just I wanted to see equality across the board. I understand. Were there other issues represented at the march that you that were relevant to you? You know, mostly I think that covered it. Okay. It was LBGT. Um, you know, the the um, women's rights and immigration, mm -hmm. okay. racism. Why was it important that you participate in the march now on, on January? Why was it important that you participate in the march now? Well, I thought it made a statement that it was the day after the inauguration. Okay. You know, um, <laughs> And the crowd that was there for the Women's March was bigger than the crowd for the inauguration, despite comments that opposed that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the fake news. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> lots of fake news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so getting to the march, was did you have, have expectations before you got on the bus to go to the march expectations like some like were you hoping to have an experience or you're expecting it to go one way or the other you know I, I don't think I expected such an enormous crowd and you know when I got there and I realized that you know when we were marching on the streets and sidewalks and everything we were basically sh shoulder to shoulder and you had to be careful stepping that you didn't step on the person in front of you um, you know as you were walking and you were just packed in and um, it you know I'm not really afraid of cra crowds and I'm not claustrophobic or anything like that but I w was aware of the fact that I felt totally at ease with it because I felt like I was among thousands of sisters you know yeah. it was it was amazing how did that feel to be among a thousand sisters. Mm -hmm. How did that feel? Um, well, it, everybody, we were interacting. If the crowd stopped, then we would start interacting with the people by us, you know, and we weren't necessarily, we, our group was together, but we had these yellow scarves and we could hold them up and say, here we are. And you knew that where your group was, but there were other people in among us because we couldn't cluster that closely. And so I got to know some young girls from New York City. Uh, one was black, one was Asian. Uh, I got to know people from all over the country. Now, you know, just for that moment, I didn't take down their email addresses. <laughs> that right. wasn't time for that. Right. But you know, and, and uh, if people tripped or stumbled or something, other people helped them up. There were, was one woman in our group who was actually using a walker and um, another one was using a cane. And, you know, people, people made room for that. They, they mm -hmm. you know, there were probably there people there with, with handicaps that I didn't even see. Mm -hmm. So did see a couple of wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. 
That's amazing. So were your friends and family supportive of you going to the march? <laughs> yes. yes. Actually, um, since my mother died, I'm the oldest person in my family. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, people don't tend to criticize you when you're the oldest. Oh. <laughs> you know, you it's were the boss. You're the boss now. <laughs> and um, my brother's wife mailed me a check for $50 and said, use this sort toward your trip. I would like to be there. Aww. So I will support you this way. Aww. Yeah. Awesome. So the group that you traveled with and marched with, can you describe that group of people? Well, my friend Nancy Newton and I were the two oldest on the bus. And um, m most people were probably in their, I would say, 40s, 50s, or 60s. There were two or three young girls there. One might have been like a college age. The other two, I think, were probably high school age. And um, I didn't get to know a lot of them because we were absolutely packed in this bus. I don't know if it was smaller than usual, but you know, we had light luggage, we didn't have much with us. But once we all got in, uh, you know, to get out in the aisle, you couldn't pass anybody in an aisle. It was just too, <laughs> too crowded, so, um, and a mixture of people. Mm -hmm. So were, did people, what was the demeanor on the bus? Were people talkative going down there, excited, anticipating, nervous? What? What was the demeanor like? Well, I think if we'd all been, you know, in our high in high school or something, we might have been playing music and singing along. But, <laughs> you know, the the roar of the bus and the, how tightly packed we were, we mostly talked with people in front of us, behind us, and across the aisle. You know that, right. yeah. and we kind of stayed in the same seats. But it, it was optimistic, and mm -hmm. everybody was encouraged to bring snacks because we weren't stopping, except between Atlanta and. Richmond would stop for the bus driver to be able to exercise and um, we got to Richmond in the morning maybe about five o'clock five or six o'clock and had breakfast at a Denny's <laughs> <laughs> then we piled back on the bus and went on up to Washington and um, they let us off the bus and told us where the bus would pick us up and so what time did you arrive in Washington do you think I think maybe around 9 30 or so and so we just kind of got off and just went to look for the march, and it wasn't hard to find. <laughs> so you'd been traveling all night? We traveled all night. Did you sleep? I don't think I went to sleep on the way up. I mean, I, I got really relaxed, but I don't think I did. But I slept on the way back. I was exhausted. <laughs> I can imagine. But then, then we marched, and we came back and ate dinner at Denny's <laughs> <laughs> and headed back again. So... Um, the people that you marched with, you said that y'all all had a, a yellow scarf as a way to identify each other. What, were there other things that you had in order to kind of keep the group together? Well, actually, no, because, you know, people had knitted the, the pink hats, yeah. and uh, we all had one. And we got there, and a lot of the marchers had them also, so that was not a way to identify. And someone, I think, Perhaps it was Jackie Spearman, um, or had someone make them, or she made them. They were just, you know, kind of like felt s scarves, mm -hmm. and uh, they were kind of a bright yellow. And what we discovered was that, you know, if we suddenly realized we weren't were totally surrounded <laughs> by strangers, we could hold it up, and somebody would come find us. <laughs> So Jackie Spearman, she organized the she, trip. She organized the entire thing beautifully, including T-shirts, pink T-shirts. With the, I, I wish I'd worn mine, but I forgot. Um, you, you know, she had ordered the bus. She had the whole everything set down exactly what we needed to do, what kind of snacks to bring to share on the road up and back. What were your feelings um, before, during, and after the march? Um, before, number one, I was really happy to get off the bus. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, we all pulled our signs out from underneath, you know, the luggage area in the bus, and uh, we started 
walking around and we started seeing other uh, signs and other people and uh, it was just one of um, you know a, a, an adrenaline rush and during it was just very comforting very optimistic you know um, look there this many women what was it 400,000 500,000 that all agree that that something's not quite right for women in the country and that that was that feeling and then when it got dark and we were near the Washington Monument and looking at the skyline of Washington, you know, just pride, pride. That, that so many people made it, made the journey. Yeah, that and so many people cared about the different issues, the women, uh, the LBGT, uh, the racial situations, the immigration, just it, I, it was great. I can feel it. Thank you. <laughs> Describe for me the atmosphere of the rally. You said it was optimistic uh, in, in, in the tone and what people were saying, the, 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 char the posters, any what? Well, you know, um, I was trying to remember some of the chants. Yeah. that would get started and I absolutely I know can I call the names of uh, of politicians yes, and, you and can. one was love Trump's hate and that one was a constant one but there were also call and response ones and there were different ones they would have to do with the different issues and there would be a call somebody or a couple of people would yell it out and then a couple of peop other people, it must have been pre-designed or maybe it was just spontaneous. And then you knew what they were saying, so you would join the response. Oh, how wonderful. And it, you know, just helped to know that there were that many people who were concerned about what was going on in our country. And making their voice, even if the voice was this call and response. And I'm ready to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember any of the other signs that you saw? <clears throat> Some of them are kind of embarrassing to repeat. <laughs> um, Must have been good. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was mostly relating related to women's genitalia, and you know, and some of the things that we had heard about the president and yeah. his a love of groping. Yes. <laughs> and. <laughs> You know, and, and yeah. a lot of LBGT, a lot, and then there were groups there that were, were with signs of, you know, um, race, you know, racism is a problem, you know, yeah. we're all the same, um, immigration, you know. And of the chants, the call and response, do you remember any, any other chants? <laughs> it's been six or seven months, so I'll forgive you if you... I wish I'd, I did because I actually called um, my friend Nancy that went last night and left her a message. Would she call me back and t tell me if she remembered any of the chants? <laughs> and, sh and she never called me back, so either she didn't get the message or she just, you know, didn't have the time or, yeah. or didn't know any. Right, right. Okay. But they, you, you know chants were going on, but just... But they were good. Yeah, between, you know, January and August, <laughs> they've kind of seeped out of my brain. <clears throat> Did you get to hear any of the speakers while you were there? You know, I didn't. Um, the only ones I heard, we were in, when we first got off, there was a, a widescreen TV close by, and there was a, a woman senator speaking, and I'm not, I, now I'm not even sure I remember which one it was. Um, I, I don't know, Feinstein or it could It could have been. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I couldn't really even see the screen. Um, I could yeah. tell it was a TV, but I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> and there were a lot of heads in front of me. But I listened. Oh. And, and yeah. And Do you remember I anything, anything of what you heard? It was, it was just talking about the issues of concern to women 
and how you know uh, maybe maybe this would get the attention that someone would listen okay. yeah. and I guess some people did but maybe not all the right people <laughs> <laughs> the law enforcement did you see police officers there the yeah I did and at the kept a low profile. You know, knew they were there. You saw their uniforms. I, I saw absolutely no disturbance among the mar marchers. I did not see any protesters. I'm sure there were probably some there, but they were terribly outnumbered. Protesters that were pro uh, protesting the march. The march. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and the police were there to, you know, like at the end, we were supposed to meet our bus at a certain place near where the march de ended, and they directed us to, to get us there, and you know they, oh. you know, they were helpful. Yeah. Oh. They really were, <laughs> um, and they can be. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they can cause problems, mm -hmm. but in this case, it, it was all positive. What do you think about the? coverage in the media? Well, you know, we really didn't get home until the next day, but I watched it and I thought the coverage of that next week was excellent. You know, they would bring up, you know, show specific speakers, which I now don't remember, but, and they would talk about the march. And um, I thought MSNBC especially did a good job, especially Rachel Maddow. Right. <laughs> She's my lady. She's she's great. Mm -hmm. um, when did it? When did it? When did you realize that this march was occurring in many cities across the country and in many cities across the world? Well, I actually um, knew to some uh, some extent because I knew there was an Atlanta march, and I had watched enough TV, you know to pick up on the fact that there were other major cities that had marches. And uh, I, I think I didn't realize there were marches in Europe um, until I got home. What do, you, <clears throat> what do you think about that? I thought that was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I think there need to be some more. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. How, how did your group manage to stay together? We talked about the yellow scarf, and you, you know, if you lost sight of people, you would would wave, wave that. Um, did you have like a a meeting point somewhere that y'all, <coughs> in case everybody got lost, just meet at one place at a certain time? Well, actually, the the march. Once you were into the march, the march was all going the same place. It's not like people were branching off and going down different streets. We were all staying on the major thoroughfare, going by you know the major build, buildings in Washington D.C., and we had been told that the march would end in the vicinity of the Washington Monument, and there were also some vendors there with food and everything. And so you know when we got to that point, then people began to go in their different directions, and we had been told to hang around the area of Washington Monument, and then we all kind of. Um, we asked the police officers where such and such street was, and we walked toward it, and there was our bus. I see. It was just, it was, it was well timed. It was well managed. It was, it was excellent. You know. So we, let me, let me ask you this: You re didn't really sleep that night because you were on the bus all night. You get there about 9:30 in the morning. You get off the bus, so you're on your feet with little to no sleep, marching until. Five or six in the afternoon. It was dark when we stopped. Now that was January, and I, I don't know. Oh, okay. Here it gets would would get dark between what five thirty and six. Right. And I think it was probably six around six o'clock. Pure adrenaline. Pure, that, that kept you going with pure adrenaline. <laughs> right. And I've never been able to sleep on public transportation. If right. I. I've been to Italy a few times, and I, I'm wide awake the whole trip. You know. <laughs> But I, I think between staying awake all night and marching in the daytime, I slept going home. <laughs> the first time.
time he slept on public transportation. <laughs> First time ever. I know how to do it. I need to go march all day and stay up awake one night. <laughs> it, it was exhilarating. I can see. So um, describe the moments that stand out the most. Was there people you saw? Uh, well, the chanting back and forth really was something that was powerful. But I actually um, met a young woman who was wearing a, a, a raincoat, a padded, you know, uh, raincoat, but it was signed with people's names all over it. And she was just kind of standing over to the side, probably waiting for her own group to come by. And I just walked over to her and I said, I like your coat. And um, I started asking her some questions and I, I finally said, may I take your photograph? And I did, and I have that photograph. How many names were on the oh, coat? Um, you know, it looks like, look to me as if maybe as many as a hundred. And so I talked to her and I asked her where, where she was from and I think she said she was from Illinois, but she had an, an accent, she had a foreign accent she had um, she, um, she had the appearance of being um, from, uh, you know, uh, a brown culture, Latino or a Middle Eastern or Indian. I think it was probably the the Middle East or the Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern um, Asia. And she had an accent, and I said, "Well, whose names are these?" And she said, "I'm a teacher." I am a history teacher, and my student signed my coat. And the coat was white, and the names really stood out. Oh. And I thought, oh, this is just perfect. You have an immigrant. You have a member of a minority race. You have someone who is involved in education in the United States. She is making a contribution to this country. And, um, you know, I just I wish our paths would cross again. Mm -hmm. Just everything that's right with the world. Yeah. Yeah. Any other moments that stand out? Mm. Well, there were times when, you know, one or two people would break out in song. <laughs> they would just kind of go over to the side and they would start singing. And it would be some... Um, um, well, one person even had a sign from, um, I can't remember the artist, uh, it wasn't Nancy Sinatra, um, but one of the women singers, you're so vain. You're so vain. You probably think this song is about you, mm -hmm. you know. Carly and it, Simon. Carly, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, and But this sign said, you're so vain, you probably think this march is about you. <laughs> and um, <laughs> But... And, and then there was a group that started singing it later. Oh. <laughs> and there would be a patriotic song every now and then, you know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, uh, America the Beautiful, I heard, oh, you know. Yeah. Okay. How, how have you been feeling since the march? Since then? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the farther away it gets, the more I, I feel like we're not a part of it, but um, my church has started a, a women's action group uh, that meets once a month. And I would say there are probably um, 40, 50 people who are in it. And we, you know, we want to do service type jobs. We want to do marches and political things. And I know th uh, there was a group that got involved just recently with the Black Lives Matter. And um, the other issues, we talk about Im immigration, and um, we get together in small groups and discuss things and then bring it to the whole crowd. And, and, it, and the women there, we meet on Tuesday afternoons sometimes and on uh, Saturday mornings sometimes so that people who work can get there at least every other time. Uh, I'm retired. Right. <laughs> I keep forgetting about that microphone. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and, okay. you know, I, I, I plan to 
see some kind of political action coming out of that. Okay. So since the march and that, that feeling of being further apart has mitigated some way by being, by y'all continuing to gather. Right, to meet. To uh, meet. Right. And, you know, I think that it probably gave me a little push forward to be as active as I could be in the John Ossoff campaign. Right. And I think he might do it again in November. Ah. Um, I wrote him a thank you note. His parents actually live on the same street that I live on. No kidding. Yes, ah. they do. <laughs> and so I've known his mother for years and, you know, I sort of knew of him. He. Um, Actually, my son went to the Paideia school, and so did he, but he was six years younger. So he's, when my son was a high school senior, he was in the sixth grade. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. How have your family and friends and colleagues responded to the fact that you marched? Well, most of my family and friends that are um, of the same political persuasion that I am, and so they're all about it. Those that are not, I don't usually bring it up um, because, you know, I have a few people that uh, do not think like I do that I want to keep as friends because I love them and I want uh, to be a part of their lives and them to be a part of mine. So usually I don't break it, bring it up, and they don't either. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had anybody. Some people are not real political, and so if I mention it to them, they they're fine with it. You know, they yeah. they just say they stay out of politics and mm -hmm. don't get involved. And I don't know how you do that. How do you not be involved when you feel like it's actually affecting you? What do you, <clears throat> excuse me, what do you hope will happen now? On the, the small picture or the big picture? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the small picture and then go to the big picture. I hope that this can just keep growing and that we can continue any time. I mean, I appreciate the fact that in this country, if we want to demonstrate as long as it's peaceful, it's okay. I was just listening to the news this morning in um, Venezuela and how, you know, the people who are demonstrating are being hurt. There have been over a thousand people hurt. I think there have been 75 people killed by the government. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm thankful I live in a country where I can do that. I'm thankful I live in a country where I can say that I'm against what my president stands for and not find myself in jail. And I'd li I'm interested in what's going to happen with the Mueller investigation of the collaboration with um, Russia, with the Trump campaign and the White House. I think there's definitely something there. They wouldn't be trying so hard to squelch it. If you have nothing to hide, then people can investigate all they want to. And I'm hoping that there will be an, an outcome for that, and I don't know if, how far I should go with that. <laughs> um, Anything else that you hope um, will happen as a result of the march and the people resisting? You know, I, I guess I'm just really um, an optimist. I still think if people really get the right information and they get to know different people who are different from them, that they will come to love them just as much as they love their their families and their friends and their neighborhood. Um, I mean, how can you look at a, a, a small black child and think anything but good things about it and their parents doing the best they can to look after the them. How can you look at a, a lesbian couple, um, two of my closest friends and the parent of one of my piano students, um, and 
not see that they have just as loving a home as anybody could want for anybody. You know, I feel like there's love in my home. If, you know, right now I, I only have one child and my husband's dead. Um, but we are a very loving family and I, I can see expanding that out to, to the point where we love just the people in our neighborhood and the people in our county and the people in our state and the country and in other countries. And we can even love and appreciate the fact that immigrants are trying to get into the country because it is such a good country. And um, I'll have to admit that if I lived in Syria, I'd be doing everything I could do to get into Europe or to get into the United States or someplace where I didn't have to fear for my life and the life of my children. So, talking about fear, what do you fear the most about the current state of affairs? Trump. Yeah. I fear him because I don't think, I think he's mentally unbalanced. Um, I think he's impulsive. I'm afraid to put him close to that button for the atomic weapons. Um, but I'm afraid the people in the White House are trying to please him so much that they just let him get away with things. And who, I mean, who can talk down to the president? I mean, you've got a really bad situation there. Mm -hmm. I would like to see him removed from office, but I don't like Pence either because he is super evangelical. And we've got, um, uh, you know, people of all different religions in this country. And, um, I mean, the God you worship as an evangelical is the same God we all worship if you're Jewish, um, Arab, um, Catholic, Protestant, Christian. Um, and I, I just don't like what's happening. I don't like what's going on and I don't see anybody standing up to him. With the possible excep uh, exception of Rosenstein, you know, in the judicial department, he was the one that recommended right. Mueller. Right. And um, I think he is the one person who could fire him. And um, he hasn't. He's done the right thing. I mean, in, in this, I mean, Jeff Sessions honestly looks better than a lot of the people up there right now. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you continue to, it sounds like with the, the women's group, that you'll continue to, um, I don't know, monitor, participate in these these issues and... Is that true? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm waiting for the next, you know, one that here in Atlanta even. I know my son and his girlfriend went to the airport, you know, when the immigration thing came up. And um, if it's a time that I can get away and go, I will go, you know. I do. And the, I, I bet money on it, Janet. <laughs> and and what, what is the group women? I, I never, in, indivisible? Yes. I've they recently got an email from them asking if I wanted to stay in that, you know, cycle, that circle, of, and I responded, yes, I want to know what's going on. And I get a lot of political stuff coming in on my email. It just, <laughs> so much I can't read it all. Right. I almost missed my email from you. <laughs> <laughs> so staying informed, I hear you. What do you, how have you felt about the new government's activities since the march? I feel like it's done nothing but go downhill all the way since the day of inauguration. I mean, I had this hope that maybe Trump would become more presidential. Um, I was in hopes that maybe he would read up on and find people to interview to see how to best handle things. But I think he just he governs like a five-year-old. Whatever he's feeling at the moment is what he does. Mm -hmm. 
and I think that's awful. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Has participating in the march, <clears throat> has it changed, has this thing changed you in any way? I think I feel empowered. <laughs> I feel like that, um, I feel like if I read enough and everything like that, I could just, actually, I think I'd run for public office if I weren't 75 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I'd vote for you in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, I, I've thought about that. I've looked at it and I thought, well, maybe school board would, would work someday. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any strategies you could suggest to people who are trying to cope with this uncertainty, this, the way things are right now? Bombard your congressmen and your senators with emails, with uh, personal mail, with every time you get any kind of a telephone number to call your sen senator about an issue, call and leave it, although frequently their uh, recording is full by the time you get around to do it. You know, uh, do every little thing you can. Mm -hmm. Put yard signs out of the people you support. Mm -hmm. um, I don't suggest trying to change people's minds because um, the way I understand it, that, that the whole way that people look at things depends on how you identify politically. And, you know, I'm not going to be able to go say to uh, small town Tennessee where I have relatives and talk my crazy cousin into the fact that he's voting against his own best interests, that what he's doing is actually going to hurt him. And um, my relatives in Alabama are, are all Democrats, so mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about them. But, mm -hmm. you know, and, and neighbors that I have or mm -hmm. people that I've known that I did have one of my next door neighbors who's a lifelong Republican and she's in her 80s. And she told me, she said, uh, I could not vote for Trump, but I couldn't vote for Hillary either, so I just didn't vote. And we need to offer some other alternatives to in the next campaign, you know. Good point. Good point. What would sort of advice would you give to anybody who's considering going to a march? Well, get involved with one of the groups like the Indivisibles or go online and look and see. Um, just type in, um, you know, political protests, Atlanta, you know, August 2017 and see what you can come up with. And because most groups want you out there marching with them. Now, I, I don't think people want to get involved in any way in any kind of march like they had in Charlottesville. Right. And I appreciate people, excuse me, um, expressing their own opinions and everything. But I don't like it that people who have um, such negative opinions that are harmful for uh, people in this country. Um, I'm not, I would prefer that they weren't allowed to march at all. Yeah. Um, but, per, you know, I would suggest that people who want to protest, that maybe they just stay at home and don't give them any attention. <laughs> <laughs> Words of wisdom. Ah, from the sage. <laughs> Well, as we start to wrap this up, Janet, um, I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk about anything regarding the march or um, the administration or the group that you're participating in um, that we haven't talked about so far. Anything you saw at the march? Anything <coughs> on the way back? What was it like when you first got back? The, the day after the march? Um, Anything? How are you feeling, Janet? Oh, my focus is so much on getting this man out of power. Um, you know, that, I mean, I'd like to have an anti-Trump march in Washington. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe half the country show up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I 
I just, I think you need to review your candidates and watch very carefully about what you're voting for. And I think we had a lot of people who were looking for salvation from their own particular problems. The problems with jobs, um, the problems with good jobs. And I feel, I feel really bad for these people. And these are the Trump supporters that come and stand up there in their Make America Great Again caps. But the fact is, is he's not going to be able to replace those jobs because um, technology is replacing it. You know, you've got robots building cars. You've got, um, um, you know, uh, solar energy, which is much better and, and cheaper and healthier than coal. And, but I feel for the people that are in, I know Bernie Sanders did a, a program with a group of people in West Virginia since the election. And hearing about the addictions there, and because the pharmacists were being shipped millions of pills and the doctors were prescribing it and then people were getting hooked. And so they were on drugs and they don't have jobs because the coal mines have closed down. And I want something for these people and for the young people especially. I mean, they, if they have no hope, where do they go? I'm, you know. Oh, and the Haitians who are immigrating to Canada to get out of the United States before they get shipped back to Haiti. Mm -hmm. you know, I think I've got my interest in so many places that it's just all scrambled. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to do, it seems, and it seems like the Women's March was a step <clears throat> in the right direction in getting people focused. Yeah, and it's time for another one. <laughs> yeah, and that you were a part of that mm -hmm. um, and sort of led the way in a number of different ways, and so thank you so much for participating in that as well as this Women's History Oral History Project, the Women's March Oral History Project. Thank you so much, Janet, for being here and sharing your, your experiences and your wisdom. Well, thank you for having me, and I have enjoyed it. <gasps> thank you. <laughs> <laughs>